Today we're going to go through the next of our pioneers. If you want to refer to the copies that you have of the timeline of the 27 pioneers, we're down now to number 14. On the timeline, it's listed as O.R.L. Crozier. In the handout that you have, you'll see that his full name is Owen Russell Loomis Crozier. And let's review some significant events from his life. Interesting uh, story here. Born in 1820 in Diagua, New York, that's southeast of Rochester. You'll find there's a lot of connections either in New England, <coughs> over in farther uh, eastern part of New England, or in central, sort of central New York State which is where the Review and Herald Publishing House was located for a long time. In the pictures that we have up here, we have the previous 13 showing, and this last uh, three uh, is our next three that we're going to look at. And this is Brother Crozier here, a distinguished looking man, dressed up, and apparently the best picture that we have of him um, on record. When he was two years of old, two years of age, uh, 1822. He's left an orphan. So I think it's unique among all the ones we've considered so far that uh, someone at that young age was left an orphan. At age 16, young man, he's converted at a Methodist revival. Uh, and sometime during his youth, probably even before this conversion at age 16, there was a physician in town, Dr. Franklin B. Hahn, and a farmer by the name of Hiram Edson, who we've already considered, right? Can you tell me which one is Hiram Edson? He's the last one. Correct. Last one in this second row here, Hiram Edson. Uh, these two gentlemen, Dr. Hahn and Hiram Edson, befriended the orphan, providing him a home and encouraging him in his studies. He attended the Genesee Academy and the Wesleyan Seminary at Lima, New York, and then, upon graduating, he taught school at the following locations in New York, Gorham, Rochester, East Avon, and Lima. The fall of 43, which was a year before the passing of the time, at the age of 23, he accepted the Millerite message and was baptized by E.R. E. Penny, and he began preaching. Not unusual for young men in those days when they accepted the message, to go out and start sharing it, preaching it. He was issued a preaching license by the Wesleyan Church after it split from the Methodist. As I recall, the Wesleyan uh, split was caused over abolition. Um, he declined to be sponsored, though, either by the Wesleyans or the Methodists for further theological studies, but as a result of his preaching, it shows his effectiveness one of his mentors from his youth, Dr. Hahn, who at the time was the president of the Village Corporation and the secretary of the County Medical Society, accepted the Advent message. So as if his preaching was effective, obviously. The summer of 44, he's now 24 years old, he dedicates himself full-time to preaching the Advent message. With Edson and Hahn, he begins publishing a periodical called Day Dawn in Canandaigua. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that right. If anyone has a better pronunciation on that, it's obviously, I think, an Indian name. Uh, again, in his hometown. You observe that? In his hometown, birth where he's born, he's publishing this paper. Um, it's all in, the, all in the general area there around Rochester. But uh, if you look at that part of New York, below Rochester, there's what they call the Finger Lakes because there's these long lakes that sort of look like fingers. Glacial lakes, I'm sure, valleys that have been scoured out by the glaciers uh, back uh, when the glaciers were covering the earth, I believe, after the flood. And Canandaigua was there at the top of one of those lakes. Along with the other Advent believers who were looking forward to the coming of Christ based on the prophecies, based on Daniel 8, 14, October 22, was a time of great disappointment for him. He was with a group 
that spent all night in prayer. If I understand correctly, they were expecting him to come by midnight. They were not thinking of, of even though they picked Jewish reckoning to find the Day of Atonement, they were not thinking of Jewish reckoning on the, on the, when the day began and ended. But they spent all night in prayer, and the next morning, October 23, again, he's a young man, he's 24 years old, he with Edson decide to go and visit the disappointed believers. Now, what does that tell you about him? He's more concerned about other people's disappointment than he is his own. He has a, a sense of pastoral duty, or at least brotherly, brotherly kindness and love. The love of Christ. Right. And so he, they decide to do this, but this is after they're leaving um, Edson's place, as I recall. Going across the field, and Edson has the inspiration that we've already considered, right? Uh, where he sees some type of uh, revelation, and God shows to him that when Christ, when the time passed, Christ did not come to this earth, but he went from the holy place to the most holy place. And so after this inspiration, he and um, Crozier, Edson and Crozier, uh, visit the disappointed believers with the news that Jesus entered the most holy place. And the sanctuary to be cleansed is at least first in heaven. Uh, I'm not sure that they said that first, but they said the sanctuary to be cleansed is in heaven. And he began to study with Han and Edson the topic of the sanctuary. In 1904, we're jumping ahead a little bit, he recounted that event with these words, quoted by a, an eyewitness. Um, he did not write this down, but a man who uh, discussed this event with him recounted this is the way he described it. Crozier speaking, I shared its, that is the disappointment of 844, its grief and distress, its distress. Mm -hmm. And I was present in that all night prayer meeting and scripture study held after the disappointment. When the light came concerning the temple in heaven, showing that this had been the object of the prophecies which we thought referred to the return of Jesus and the cleansing of the earth by fire, what a joy this light was to us. Very early in the morning, I was on horseback going from place to place to tell the good news and to cheer those whom I could reach. By... March of the next year, in other words, uh, he spent the winter, right? Fall and winter. Disappointment was there in October. Now it's March of the next year. He's 25 years of age this year. He actually has an article. Obviously, out of the study that he's done with Edson and Dr. Hahn, he writes up the <clears throat> article. This young school teacher is chosen to be the scribe <laughs> to record what they have studied. And an article was printed on the sanctuary in the, the periodical Day Dawn. The story is that Mrs. Edson, Hiram's wife, sold some of her silverware to finance the printing. So this is the devotion of those early people. They were willing to invest in what they were convicted of. The fall of that year, 1845, still age 25, he begins keeping the seventh-day Sabbath. And then February of the next year, 1846, February the 7th, in his 26th year, he prints a more complete systematic exhibition on the sanctuary in an article entitled The Law of Moses. This was published over out west in Cincinnati, <laughs> because at the time, Ohio was to the west. And uh, again, I find it interesting because I was in Cincinnati just a few days ago. And it obviously was a center back then. It was a place where they were publishing uh, another Advent periodical called the Daystar. And they actually printed an extra edition of it, <clears throat> extra issue of it, to, uh, that included this article on the Law of Moses. Would you like to hear something from that article? Sure. The next paragraph is an extract from that. It's on the CD-ROM, by the way. As you can see the reference there, LOM is Law of Moses, or LC is his initials, which is the author code. Um, the sanctuary was the heart of the typical system. 
There the Lord placed his name, manifested his glory, and held converse with the high priest relative to the welfare of Israel. While we inquire from the scriptures what the sanctuary is, let all educational prejudice be dismissed from the mind. For the Bible clearly defines what the sanctuary is and answers every reasonable question you may ask concerning it. The name sanctuary is applied to several different things in the Old Testament. Neither did the wonderful number tell Daniel, Daniel what sanctuary was to be cleansed at the end of the 2300 days, but called it the sanctuary, as though Daniel well understood it. And that he did is evident from the fact that he did not ask what it was. When Gabriel came you know, to, uh, to talk to him there, he wasn't, wasn't involved with that. Um, but it, as it has now become a matter of dispute as to what the sanctuary is, our only safety lies in seeking from the New Testament, the divine comment upon it. Its decision should place, its decision, the New Testament's decision, should place the matter beyond all controversy with Christians. <clears throat> Again, I encourage you to review that if you have a chance that entire article uh, on, on the law of Moses. I say that because this was published uh, in 1846, February 7, right? If you observe carefully, the next entry we have on the handout is eight days later, February the 15th, 1846. And this, on this date, Ellen White in Daystar, um, March 14 is when it was published, but it was she wrote it February 15. This is what she said. God showed me the following one year ago this month. So when would that be? 45. February of 45, which, if you look carefully at it, is before... <clears throat> The first article in the sanctuary was printed by Edson, right? But after her first vision, when was her first vision? Soon after December, of December of 44. Okay, so December of 44. Now she's saying a year ago this month, February of 46, takes us back to February of 45. So February of 45 is basically two months after her first vision. I, uh, the Lord showed me the following. I saw a throne. Does this sound familiar? And on it sat the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> I gazed on Jesus' countenance and admired His lovely person. Does this ring any bells with anybody? What we're reading? Where is this recorded elsewhere? Early, Early writings. Page four, 54, if I recall correctly. <clears throat> I gazed on Jesus' countenance and admired His lovely person. The Father's person I could not behold, for a cloud of glorious light covered him. I asked Jesus if his Father had a form like himself. He said he had, but I could not behold it. For, said he, if you should for once see the glory of his person, you would cease to exist. Before the throne was the Advent people, the church and the world. So before the throne, who, who's before the throne? The heaven people, the church, and the world. The, everyone is before the throne. <clears throat> you got that? I saw the company bow down before the throne. They saw a company bow down before the throne. She didn't say here which one, but observe carefully. Deeply interested while most of them stood up and uh, disinterested and careless. So not everyone before the throne is deeply interested with what's happening uh, there, right? Those who were bowed before the throne would offer up their prayers and look to Jesus. Then he would look to his Father and appear to be pleading with him. What does the Bible call that? Intercession. Intercession. Then a light came from the Father to his Son and from him to the praying group. Who's the go-between? Jesus. He's always been that. The latter, the mediator, the word. <laughs> Then I saw an exceeding bright light come from the Father to the Son, and from the Son it waved over the people before the throne. 
but few would receive this great light. Many came out from under it and immediately resisted it. Others were careless and did not cherish the light, and it moved off from them. Some cherished it and went and bowed down before the throne with the little praying company. This company all received the light and rejoiced in it as their countenances shone with its glory. Do you have any idea what light she's referring to here? Okay. Uh, in her first vision, she had a view of a, of a pathway. Different scene, different picture type of thing, but it's a pathway, and the Advent people are not before the throne. They're on this journey, on this pathway. Uh, I would think it's probably volume one, if, I think, if it's recorded in the testimonies, but it's in the early writings. Her first vision is in early writings as well. Um, at the beginning of that path, there was a bright light, and the angel told her there that bright light was the midnight cry, and it enabled these people to walk in the path. So if this light is the same as that, it's a light that, observe, the, when the people were praying and Christ was interceding, there was light coming from the Father to the Son to the people. But then she says, I saw an exceeding bright light. This was out of the ordinary. And this actually caused people to make decisions. And some responded to it, some resisted it, some accepted it apparently but didn't cherish it and they finally moved out from under it. That's sort of, I think, like the people who denying the light behind them on the path and they fall off the path because they can't see the path anymore. Obviously, the path that the light's pointing, they're not wanting to walk in. So that's a picture of that. Um, I believe it's referring to the events clearly before the disappointment before October uh, 22, because of what she says next. Observe. Then I saw the Father rise from the throne and in a flaming chariot go into the Holy of Holies within the veil and did sit. Where did she see them sitting to start with? Apparently, it is the first apartment because uh, she doesn't say specifically, she says, I saw a throne. But here she's seeing the Father rise from the throne. And again, she's not seeing him. She's seeing this light. <laughs> light rises from the throne and gets into a chariot and is taken off to the Holy of Holies. Now, pause there. What type of picture do you get of the heavenly sanctuary? Big. It's big, right. <laughs> You've got to take a chariot to go to the next one. Yeah. It's yeah. big. Yeah. And I would encourage you to look back to Great Controversy. I don't have a reference for you here. But she says very plainly in talking about the sanctuary and great controversy that the, the grandest, most glorious building that was ever built on this earth mm. was what? Temple. Solomon's temple. Oh, I see. She, like said, she yeah. said that that most glorious building the earth has ever seen <clears throat> was only a faint reflection of the vastness and the glory of the heavenly. Okay, so I'm thinking of that word vast when I think of this. If it's vast, uh, picture is getting around there in, in some type of wheel, wheel vehicles or flaming chariots. Maybe not wheels, but uh, angel vehicles. Okay. It also talks about that the, uh, the river of life issues from the throne. That's right. And that thing's big. Yeah. Amazon big. River of life from the throne. So the Father moves into this flaming chariot, goes into the holiest holies, and he sits before the, uh, within the veil. There, where's there? Most Holy of Holies. I saw thrones which I had not seen before. And again, the earthly type does not depict this. So again, don't think that the heavenly is an exact representation of, of, of what... Right. They took the... The essential features, perhaps. They have to transport this thing. Right. It was portable to start with. Even Solomon's was different than the portable sanctuary. Well, there are things that weren't necessary for them to know then. Right. But we've had revealed to us now, right. which clarify certain things that are critical for us. The Lord put into the earthly sanctuary exactly what was needed for the people at the time. And uh, we're obviously seeing more as things unfold and... 
Obviously, John saw things in heaven and the throne and the sanctuary setting that uh, are not depicted there in the Old Testament types. 24 elders, right? Thrones. <laughs> and again, John's context is candlesticks, altar of incense, Ark of the Covenant. So it's clearly uh, what the pattern was that Moses was shown of the original, and which each, Hebrews talks about clearly. Each prophet is given a certain focus mm -hmm. for his vision. Yes, each, what is to be conveyed. Each prophet is given a certain focus. And it, we, we accept what they say they saw right. as what they saw. Who are we to say what they saw does not exist or what they saw they did not see? I mean, it's like uh, uh, they're witnessing as reputable individuals, which every evidence that we have is that they were under the inspiration of God when they were shown what they saw and also when they recorded it. Continuing her statements here, I saw thrones of which I had not seen before. Then Jesus rose from the throne. Now, where would that obviously be? Holy place. Uh, outside of the Holy of Holies, because he was sitting with the Father. Father got up, chariot, went to the Holy of Holies. She didn't say anything about Jesus getting up. Now he's getting up. Jesus rose from the throne, and most of those who were bowed down rose up with him. And I did not see one ray of light pass from Jesus to the careless multitude after he rose up, and they were left in perfect darkness. Again, here's the picture of the Advent experience. And there's a transition taking place in Jesus' ministry. First, they thought it was a transition to this earth. But as they studied it, and as she was shown it here, obviously, it's a transition in heaven. And those who are willing to move with God in this transition accept the biblical evidence for what happened. They proceed with greater light and understanding. Those who don't, do they stop calling themselves Christians? No. But they reject the advancing light. And she says they're left in perfect darkness. Um, now, I, I think she's speaking there in corporate terms. She's not talking in individual terms. There are, other, there, there are individual Christians who have light still. Uh, they still have a walk with the Lord. But the corporate bodies that rejected the advancing light of the angels' messages, how can you be blessed of God and moving on with God if that if the, if that very thing that he's focused on and doing you're denying you're rejecting that so this is the perfect darkness that she's talking about she's not talking about um, no hope of salvation or whatever else but uh, anyway that that was something they struggled with you know those that did not accept the message was that or that was their probation still left for them even in the advent movement uh, if they didn't accept the advent message it was no light for them too uh, again, recall in Great Controversy, she says those that did not move with Jesus from the holy place to the most holy place are like the Jews who did not move from what? <coughs> from the symbols to the reality. Okay, The Jews had the symbols and Christ came to fulfill the reality of it. And they were unwilling to leave the symbols behind and accept the reality. And she says the, the Advent Christians that did not move from the holy to the most holy places, just like the Jews that did not move from the type to the antitype. So basically, the Jews are actually wanting to do what in Palestine right now? Rebuild the temple. Reinstitute the types, right? Because they see that they see no light in the fact that they've been fulfilled. And if they do that, if they build a third temple, there's plans for that, uh, it will be a, a yet another manifestation of unbelief in Jesus Christ and what he came to do and everything that he fulfilled from the Old Testament and all the evidence that we have that he was, he was that which the Old Testament pointed to. And he will focus them more on the physical than the spiritual once again. Yeah. Right. Focusing on the physical, this earth, rather than on the heavenly, which was what Moses was shown. So then we can say likewise. The Christians that do not understand the most holy place ministry of Christ after it has been proclaimed for 150 plus years, they are 
there's they're very much like the Jews who how can they move on with God in what he's doing right now when they're denying the fact that he he's where he's where he is Christ's ministry is lo located where it is and the ministry there actually is an end time ministry that is necessary before Christ returns does that make sense so again um, it's unbelief to not move on with Christ. Did you have a comment? Okay. Yeah, I just don't know if it's appropriate. Okay. If, if, if you're convinced of this later, that's fine. Can we say that the Adventist feast keepers in a way are doing this? The, que okay. the question is about the Adventist feast keepers. Are they, in a, in a sense, doing this? You mean like the 13th annual Sabbath? Yeah. yeah. There, there are a lot of Adventists who are saying that we should be keeping the, the, the ceremonial feast days. Uh, the, to the degree to which they detract from what, what uh, we are currently in, which anti-typical feast day are we currently in? Day of Atonement. Okay. And that is not something that comes once a year on the Jewish cycle. We are in that. We have been in that since 1844. And in fact, the evidence, as, as we studied in Revelation, is that that Day of Atonement will not end <coughs> until the scapegoat is dealt with, which is the millennium. Okay? We're in that day. The degree to which we're, as we focus on any past symbols and types, to the neglect of what we are currently in, antitypically, to that degree, it's unbelief. I have no problems with remembering you know, I think it's better to remember the Jewish cycle than it is the pagan cycle and think of Easter and Christmas and, you know, all this other stuff. Yeah. That's also on a yearly cycle, right? Yeah. Much better to go back and, and realize where we are on that biblical cycle. But again, the focus on the symbols um, without the, without what they really must, right, must constantly take us to the reality. Yeah. The, spring, the spring festivals have been fulfilled. At Christ's first coming, um, and I'm not saying they've been fulfilled in their entirety, because if you look at that, there's details that there's evidences that, that more is still to come. Uh, the fall festivals we're in the process because we're in the time period of the second advent. The fall festivals relate to that. Did you have something else? That I was just going to say, uh, you know, uh, the thing about the, the, the thirteen Sabbaths is that they show. Big window on Christ, who He is, and right. His ministry, and what He's doing. Right. And for 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 a hundred to help that understand that, I think it's important. Yeah. As for them having some place, mm -hmm. no, because Christ is, is the living version. Mm -hmm. Too often we yeah. embrace the item without Him. Exactly. You know, yeah. it's like worshiping the cross without Christ right. is right. Is or taking the worship. taking the communion bread and, and not realizing really what it's pointing to. Right. Uh, deal, accepting the symbol as the reality is unbelief as well, uh, and uh, the danger is that again we can look look at the, the symbol and not the exactly church, which the Catholic Church. What what is that, that called when they it's transform transubstantiation. Trans. Yeah, the 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 most uh, observation is this: the most extreme example of making the symbol a reality mm -hmm. is the mass. Because they say it literally becomes the bread, the body of Christ. So um, they focus it on the physical yeah. thing. Yeah. Exactly. Let's continue with her description here of what she saw February of 1845. Those who rose with Jesus, those who rose up when Jesus did, kept their eyes fixed on him as he left the throne and led them out a little way. Then he raised his right arm and we heard his lovely voice saying, Wait ye, I am going to my Father to receive the kingdom. Keep your garments spotless, and in a little while I will return from the wedding and receive you to myself. Now this is biblical language. Do you know where it's found? And when Jesus is going to go back to his Father after he is rising from you should be familiar with where these uh, biblical references are found. Okay? If, pardon? 
if you, I think both of these we'll find in Luke, actually. Um, let's look, if you want to put a reference, I didn't put any of these references in there, but if you want to put a reference, it's Luke chapter 12. Uh, one, of, one of them is. Luke chapter 12. Um, he's here giving um, some parables and teachings. But specifically, verse 35. This is a little bit like um, the Sermon on the Mount in, in Luke's version of the Gospel. If you look through the chapter. He says in verse 35, let, let your waist be girded and your lamps burning. Now again, in the symbolism, uh, when Paul talks about the waist being girded, what is it, what is it girded with? Truth. Truth. Exactly. And that means, again, if I understand it correctly, the symbolic language, let the creative faculties of your mind, because Peter calls it the loins of your mind, okay, the creative faculties of your mind be girded about with truth. Don't spend your time imagining fantasy. Let it be girded about with truth. And so that you will be able to perceive the unseen realities. Um, if you spend your time thinking about Hollywood's fantasy or anything, anybody else's fantasy, you're not going to be with your minds girded, right? You're going to, it's going to be, you're going to be loose all over the place. Um, and your lamp's burning. What is that imagery? That, that means you ha you're letting the Holy Spirit bring light from this word. Okay? The, out of the, the lamps are burning, it means there's lamps and there's oil and it's on fire, right? Yeah. This is the lamp. Yeah. The oil is the Holy Spirit and he's bringing light out of the word. Can you yeah. Yeah. picture that? And you yourselves be like men who wait for their master when, what? He shall return from the wedding, that when he comes and knocks, they may open to him immediately. Very, very uh, significant imagery there. Then over in chapter 19, Christ is coming down to the wire on his crucifixion. And he's headed into Jerusalem for this last Passion Week, we call it. And he's concerned uh, because there are people who are confused on the time. Sound familiar? The Advent believers were confused on the time, right? If you don't know where you are in God's timetable, you, you're, you're at risk of being disappointed by running ahead of God and wondering where He is or lagging behind Him and not cooperating with Him and making Him disappointed that you are so slow of, of unbelief. Um, verse 11 of 19. As they heard these things, uh, this is the Zacchaeus story, <laughs> He spoke another parable because he was near Jerusalem and because they thought what? The kingdom, of God would appear. the kingdom of God would appear immediately. And so what does he say? A certain nobleman went to a far country to do what? To receive a kingdom and return. Now, isn't that exactly the language that Ellen White's been using here? Luke 12, verses 35 and 36, and Luke 19, verse 11 and 12. So here she's describing it. Get the picture. Christ is going to go, he's leaving this earth at the ascension, going back to heaven. Okay. And during that time he's in heaven, he's going to receive a kingdom. But it does not happen immediately upon his ascension. Fifty days later was the evidence of his reception of the kingdom. He is inaugurated as our high priest fifty days later. But the picture in Daniel's prophecy was that at the end of the time periods, he would again appear before the Father and there would be given to him the kingdom. Okay, So that's at the end of the time period. Actually, the time period that she's being introduced to here, this transition. Because he's, he doesn't receive the kingdom until he goes into the Holy of Holies with the Father at this point in time. He, he has a position on a throne. But again, picture what the kingdom is. What is the kingdom? It's his people, okay? And again, in the New Testament era, how is the Bible picture Christ receiving his people from this earth? Yeah. Marriage. But how, is the, how does the invitation go out? It, 
the, commi- the gospel commission when Christ left to his disciples was to take the wedding invitation where? The highways and byways. Everywhere. Everywhere. Okay? Okay. Does that mean I'm going to be back within just a few years? They, they thought so. Um, and in fact, Paul had to address that explicitly in his second letter to the Thessalonians. No, he says there, there has to be a falling away first. Don't you remember the prophecies of Daniel? Specifically Daniel 11. Okay? And so it's clear that they, it wasn't going to happen in their, that, that time. But the gospel went in the days of the apostles to the world. It says it plainly there in Colossians chapter 1. But that was not for Christ to return. That was to prepare the world for the, for the great apostasy. Because they would need the good news for there to be some survivors of that great falling away. But there was to, it, the gospel, the global gospel message was to be revived clearly based on the prophecies in Revelation. As was mentioned earlier, the three angels, right? Every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And this is the final revival of this global message. So it's the final invitation to the wedding. And again, in, the in, in, in responding to the invitation, those who say yes to the invitation, they become part of the kingdom. The kingdom. They become part of the bride. <laughs> you want to think of that way. See, one, one picture is that the king has a kingdom. The other picture is the bride has his bride. The bridegroom has his bride. So these are different metaphors describing the same reality. But this is a picture of, of, of the Father and the Son moving into the final process of making this kingdom up, determining those who comprise it, or the bride making herself ready, the language of Revelation, which is a process as well. So again, this is the language that she's using to describe that kingdom language. Yes? Yes, Right. And the sanctuary. Uh, it's, like, it's like God has, the Father has his vast right. temple, and the bricks are made up of these living stones. Right. And Jesus will have his, probably a smaller one, but he will still have his, his temple, his people, and it says that we are polished by him and him mm-hmm. by him as living stones right. in his temple. We are the living stones that make up the temple. In Paul goes so far to say is the apostles and prophets were the were the were the uh, laid on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ Himself being the <coughs> cornerstone. That's Ephesians two, I think it is. Uh, very very. There's a lot of temple Im- imagery through the New Testament. It's very useful. In fact, all of Scripture to, to review that. Continuing her description here. Keep your garments spotless, and in a little while I will return from the wedding and receive you to myself. I saw a cloudy chariot. Notice the previous one was a flaming chariot. This is a cloudy chariot with wheels like flaming fire. Now this one does have wheels. Uh, Angels were all about the chariot. As it came to where Jesus was, he stepped into it and was born to the holiest, where the Father sat. Okay, So the movement is like a two-phase movement. The Father moves there, and then Jesus... uh, has these words for his followers, and then he goes in there. Then I beheld Jesus as he was before the Father, a great high priest. On the hem of his garment was a bell and a pomegranate, a bell and a pomegranate. Then Jesus showed me the difference between faith and feeling. And I saw those who rose up with Jesus send up their faith to Jesus in the holiest, and praying, Father, give us thy spirit. Jesus, then Jesus would breathe on them the Holy Ghost. In that breath was light, power, and much love, joy, and peace. Then I turned to look at the company who were still bowed before the throne. They did not know that Jesus had left it. Satan appeared to be by the throne, trying to carry on the work of God. I saw them look up to the throne and pray, Father, my Father, give us thy spirit. Then Satan would breathe on them an unholy influence. In it there was light and much power, but no sweet love, joy, and peace. The fruits of the Spirit, in other words, are missing. Satan's object was to keep them deceived and to draw back and deceive God's children. Deceived particularly about what, clearly? Deceived about what? Where Jesus was. Where Jesus was. And and that, by implication, was what he was doing. 
Because location means activity. Location means activity. And if they're not cooperating with him in his activity, then it's clear they're not going to be among the wise virgins who go with him into the wedding, right? They're, they're very likely going to be among the foolish virgins. Catholicism, they still have him on a cross. Yes. He's, he's left that and gone. Right. right. He's not in the courtyard on the cross still. <laughs> he's not even in the holy place. In terms of his only ministry, I'm not saying the holy place ministry doesn't continue. Because on the Day of Atonement, the Holy Place ministry continued. But he's moved on from that. And unless you follow him along, you're not with him in all that he's doing. Satan's object was to keep them deceived and to draw back and deceive God's children. I saw one after another leave the company who were praying to Jesus in the holiest and go and join before the throne and, and go and join those before the throne. And they at once received the unholy influence of Satan. So there is even people she saw that were there praying to Jesus, where? In the holiest, in the Holy of Holies. And they left that, and they went back in their experience to the holy place. They didn't want to go on with God into the experience described as the most holy place experience. The teachings that come from there and the experience. Uh, and again, it's pictured as the most... Uh, intimate of all the, the, the experiences you have with God. Isaiah 6 reveals that, that, that picture when you see God in the Holy of Holies. What happens to you? You see yourself as you are. And like Isaiah, you say, woe is me. Some people don't like that revelation. They don't want to see themselves as they really are. And so they pull back from that. They don't want the, they don't want the transparency, the intimacy that the Most Holy Place uh, talks about. They want to keep hiding from God. And that's, that's again, the, the, the practical realities of it. They want um, to imagine themselves better and purer than they are. Right. They want to, they want to die in their sins, not from their sins. Right. Their sins. It's, it's a, a, a picture, again, of those who are unwilling to receive the ISAF. They still want to think that they are rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. Um, so this is the... the pictures that's being painted for us here. Now, keep that in mind because it's going to apply in a sad way to the story that we're actually reviewing, the story of O.R.L. Crozier. Okay? But before we do that, let's move on to a few other statements here. This is in the statement now of Ellen White's uh, February the 20, I'm sorry, April the 21st of 1847. Again, the year that we're dealing with now is a year after that Law of Moses article was written, right? Everything we've been reading so far was written right there, the month it was written, February of 46. Now we're in April of 47. And this is Ellen White's Word to the Little Flock, on, also on the CD-ROM under her writings. I believe the sanctuary to be cleansed at the end of the 2300 days is the New Jerusalem temple of which Jesus is a minister. The Lord shew me in vision more than a year ago, so more than a year ago would have been before April of 46, right? That Brother Crozier, that Brother Crozier, it's right there on that table there. That Brother Crozier had what? The true light. The true light. On the cleansing of the sanctuary, etc. And that it was his will, God's will, that Brother C referring in an abbreviated form to Brother Crozier, should write out the view which he gave us in the Daystar Extra, February 7, 1846. I feel fully authorized by the Lord to recommend that extra to every saint. Okay? And again, it's on the CD-ROM, if you want to access the entire article, Law of Moses, written that uh, February 7 of 1846. And there's her encouragement for those there to read it. Um, again, it's, it's somewhat developed, but somewhat embryonic at the same time, in terms of her understanding of what the Most Holy Place was all about. And uh, progressive, light. progressive light. We can go back and thank God for this amazing <clears throat> advance in terms of the understanding of the Christians at that time as to what the sanctuary comprised, what was taking place uh, at that time. Now, before I, I leave the subject, in general, I felt it would be very important to quote something that Ellen White wrote some 40 years later, 
Did she stop talking about the sanctuary no. after those early years? Did she ever stop talking about the sanctuary? Um, it was being attacked after the turn of the century by a man named Ballinger, and she very pointedly was reaffirming, 60 years later, the light that had come in these early years on these messages. The third angel's message particularly was the message that came to us from what location? The most, the most holy place. The other messages had come from the holy place because it wasn't until after the second angel's message, after the midnight cry, that Jesus went into the most holy place. And so then the first message to come from that location was the third angel's message. Which was so, 1888. Pardon? Which was 1888. No, it was 1844. Was when, was when Jesus moved into the most holy place and sent the third angel's message. Now you're thinking about the comments in 88 where she says the message of justification by faith yes. is the third angel's message okay. in verity. Yes. Okay. In other words, uh, again, just to touch on 88, and why she says it's the third angel's message. Um, the message in 88 is particularly identified with Revelation 18, which was the la is, is the last message in Revelation, as pictured to going to the world. Uh, last message of coming out of Babylon. This is the final message. But these messages are cumulative, as we've said before. They're cumulative. And so this message in Revelation 18 was often called the loud cry of the third angel. But it actually repeats the message of the second angel, Babylon has fallen. So again, it's, it's a cumulative message that encompasses the previous ones in a very profoundly important way, if we understand it properly. Um, that's what was being said. But again, the first message, chronologically, that came from the Most Holy Place was after the passing of the time. And in fact, it's in early writings. Look for it there carefully. She saw that when Jesus went into the Most Holy Place, he sent an angel from heaven to earth with the third angel's message. Which means that from the Holy of Holies, there, be, there began to be unfolded to them light on the sanctuary, which Crozier is helping us with. But not only the sanctuary, what was the other major truth from the most holy place? The Sabbath. Which they found, in a sense, in the heart of the sanctuary, in the tables of the law that were in the ark, and right in the heart of the law, there's the seventh, seventh day Glory Sabbath. Glory shining on the Sabbath. Glory shining on the Sabbath more than all the others. So here... Forty years later, Ellen White is writing about this experience and uh, affirming uh, what took place at that time. This is in the um, Great Controversy of uh, the 1911 version, page 423, but it was first written in the uh, 1888 version of the Great Controversy. The subject of the sanctuary was the key, which unlocked the mystery of the disappointment of 1844. It opened to view a complete system of truth, connected and harmonious, showing that God's hand had directed the great Advent movement and revealing present duty. In other words, it's not just what Jesus is doing in heaven. What he's doing in heaven has a decided relation to what we need to be doing here on earth. Right? Present duty as it brought to light the position and work of his people. As the disciples of Jesus, after the terrible night of their anguish and disappointment, were glad when they saw the Lord, so did those now rejoice, who had looked in faith for his second of coming. They had expected him to appear in glory to give reward to his servants. As their hopes were disappointed, they had lost sight of Jesus, and with Mary at the sepulcher they cried, They have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. Now, in the Holy of Holies... They again behold, beheld him, their compassionate high priest, soon to appear as their king and deliverer. Light from the sanctuary illumined the past, the present, and the future. One of the clear statements that the sanctuary light can give us an understanding of the timeline, okay? past, present, and future. They knew that God had led them by his unerring providence, Though, like the first disciples, they themselves had failed to understand the message which they had borne, yet it had been in every respect correct. In proclaiming it, they had fulfilled the purpose of God, and their labors had not been in vain in the Lord, no more than the early disciples had been. Okay? And again, we need not to be ashamed of this part of our history, the great disappointment. Even though our enemies say that our explanation of it is a face-saving device, 
No, it is in the clear parallel of the early disciples. We have nothing to be ashamed of any more than the early disciples did. We should not be hiding behind locked doors for fear of the Jews, figuratively speaking. <laughs> right. We have a message to proclaim uh, from the most holy place to take to all the world. And we're studying the history of the Advent movement, and that's what they devoted their lives to, carrying this third angel's message in all over the place, much better than we're doing it today. They were going to villages, holding tent meetings, raising up churches here and there all over the place. Uh, I'm talking about North America in particular. There are places in the world where, where that's happening still. But it seems like in North America we've, uh, we've stopped doing that in some respects. In proclaiming it, they had fulfilled the purpose of God and their labor had not been in vain in the Lord. Begotten again, using the words of Peter, begotten again unto a lively hope, a living hope, not a dead hope, which was self-centered and focused on their own egocentric concerns. Begotten unto a lively hope, they rejoiced with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Glory of the most holy place. Great Controversy 423. So, coming back to our brother Crozier, who helped us so much to understand this theme of the sanctuary, writing up the study from the Bible. December of 46, he advocated the Sabbath uh, in the periodical Day Dawn, 46. 26 years old. The next year, age 27, 1847, he separates fully from the Sabbath-keeping Adventist and their view on the sanctuary and the Sabbath. And through 1853, was on the staff of Joseph Marsh's Advent Harbinger and Advocate in Rochester. And if you want to understand uh, how the Sabbath-keeping Adventists dealt with this, read Joseph Bates' pamphlet entitled A Vindication of the Seventh-day Sabbath. Because in that, it's also on the CD-ROM, in his collection of writings, in that he is answering Joseph Marsh and the Advent Harbinger and Advocate's writings against the Seventh-day Sabbath, which obviously, uh, at this point, Crozier was involved with. So, so Crozier now, even though he advocates the Sabbath the year before, now he says he doesn't? Right. And the sanctuary he left as well. It's amazing, isn't it, how Crozier... What happened that year? And, uh, I don't know that. fully what happened. But again, recall what she said up here. I saw one after another leave the company who were praying to Jesus in the holiest and go and join those before the throne in the holy place, in other words. And they at once received an unholy, unholy influence of Satan. So again, let him, that taketh, think he stand, let him that think he standeth take heed lest he fall. Okay? And this is an example for us. Now, uh, the evidence that we have is that the next decade, he was an evangelist in the Michigan Conference of the Advent Christian Church. This was the branch of the Millerites that did not accept the Sabbath in the sanctuary. They formed the Advent Christian Church. Still in existence. Is it? Not very large. They have, they have a library of, ad, of Advent material at one of, their, in, one of their educational institutions, I understand. It's a resource for some of this early material. So, Advent Christian Church? Yes. Right, right. And I would imagine by this point in time, as, uh, by that I mean now, they, they say Christ is coming, but we don't know when, type of thing. And we have no history, pardon? I'm sorry. When they left the light of the most mm -hmm. holy place, they couldn't see the law anymore either, right. could they? Right. Now, when you turn away from the most holy place, Neither the sanctuary or the Sabbath have, has the significance that it does in the, in the light of that. William Miller denied the sanctuary also? He never accepted it uh, as an explanation, as I understand it. Um, yeah. But it won't be laid to his charge. The Lord, the Lord will be the judge. We know that uh, the case of William Miller, the angels are guarding his dust, Ellen White says. But again, if you want to refer to the chart that we've done of the pioneers, those that have at the end of their timelines, a little x, or a uppercase x. So that means they did not, they were Millerites, God used them and helped in the movement in some respect, but they did not continue in the advancing light of the Sabbath and the sanctuary. So that basically is what we're trying to portray with that. 
at the beginning of the lines, the M means that they were in the Millerite movement. They were involved with that. Not all of them were, as we've seen, like uh, last time we considered this man. He wasn't in the Millerite movement because they weren't keeping the Sabbath. And how can that be led, led of God? Um, so that was the experience. We have no history of him the next 50 plus years, which I find sort of interesting. Uh, but he shows up again in 1904, as we already alluded to by quoting him back there on the first page regarding that horse ride, horseback ride the day after the disappointment. He visited the Grand Rapids, Michigan Seventh-day Adventist Church. He's 84 years old. And he shares the story of the historical ride, October 23, with Edson to tell the good news about Jesus in the sanctuary. That's found in um, an article W.A. Spicer put in the review in 1945. But he is recounting it because the gentleman who was there, who met with Crozier, saw this gentleman, and you know, any good pastor would see who the visitors are, right? Inquire. You know about the visitors, and he met this gentleman, and he found out who he was. And um, actually, I think Crozier's son had a shoe store in the, in town there in Grand Rapids. And the pastor said, "Is this? Are you related to this man who has the shoe?" Yes, he's my son. And then then he tells him, "I'm I was the one who was with Edson back there, and and uh, related what I read to you earlier from the first page there, uh, from the recollection of the man who actually heard him. Uh, he was asked to write up that story, and so." Spicer very wisely put it in the Review and Herald so that we have the record. A change of heart? It was it was obviously in his older years he was not um, so antagonistic that he was unwilling to visit the Seventh Day Adventist Church, and obviously by 1904 he had seen uh, the difference in the growth of the Seventh Day Adventist Church compared to the Advent Christian Church, and something led him to visit the church there. Uh, I don't see any evidence that there was more than that visit in terms of, I think um, what happened was that before the conversation really ended, he was distracted. When he came back, the man was gone and he never saw him again. So whether or not he didn't go to the shoe store and track him down, I don't know the, the part of that story. But he, the record is that he died some eight years later at the age of 92 in 1912. So again, Brother Crozier, uh, used by God to study Scripture after that, that disappointing time. As a young man preaching the Advent, seeing people converted under the influence of the Holy Spirit in the Advent movement, pre studying with Edson, the subject of the sanctuary, writing it up, no less. Even seeing the light of the Sabbath from the Most Holy Place for a while, but a very short while, and then finally turning his back on it, and apparently not taking it up again after that. But we can thank God that the light of the sanctuary is still shining and the evidence is still po all pointing that direction, that there's a work going on there. It's been delayed, but still it must be finished. There will be a people who will follow Christ by faith into the most holy place and they will be willing to see God as he is and themselves as they are and see their need of the blood from the courtyard, <laughs> sprinkled there on the, on the mercy seat in their behalf.